All right. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a great Tuesday evening. Thanks for joining me on this webinar. Tonight, we will cover core training that matters, um, how to train the foot, core, and breathing to impact your running performance. Uh, I'm getting very excited for this topic. A little bit different, uh, I think, than and if we see core training, we'll automatically we think of just traditional core training. We're going to really connect different things, how the foot, breathing, uh, core all work together from a stabilization standpoint. So I think for a lot of you, it would be pretty educational to connect the dots, see what you're missing rather than isolating specific areas. We'll talk about that to some degree, but then how do we put it together in a very comprehensive way? Um, my name is Garrett McLaughlin. Those of you that are new on the webinar, we have a pretty... Again, small group tonight, about 25 people on here right now uh, and a lot of regulars. So welcome back to those of you who have again, worked with, are working with, or have watched my webinars in the past. Uh, before we get started, do me a favor, silence any technology around you, cell phones, TVs. Um, like I always say, a lot of little details in here that I want to make sure you really fully understand and learn how to implement in your program moving forward. Take a second, locate somewhere on your screen, there should be a Q&A button. Click that button, that's a way to comment, question, or provide feedback to me directly. Um, if you have anything right now that you specifically wanna get from the webinar today that you didn't add in the registration, feel free to, to drop a line right now so I know, and I'll try to make sure I cover that to the best of my ability. At the very end, like usual, we were raffling, raffling off one free month, the Healthy Running Program. Uh, make sure you are present to enter your name. I will put up a little poll on the screen so you can enter yes or no if you're interested in that running analysis, uh, movement evaluation, and then custom one month strength injury prevention program. Um, for those of you that can't send, stay for the entire webinar or just want to reflect back on the content, I will be sending out a re webinar replay tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time. This will have the replay. This will have the winner of the raffle. Um, you'll have all the information if you want to reflect back on this content just to make sure everything is crystal clear on your end. So before we get into the content, let me take a second and introduce myself. My name is Garrett McLaughlin. I'm a licensed athletic trainer, strength conditioning coach, and certified active release techniques provider. ART is just a type of soft tissue manual therapy. Um, pretty popular with runners, but good for a lot of common overuse injuries, nerve entrapments, those types of things. Um, I run what's called the Healthy Running Program, which helps runners, again, regardless of goals, work with runners, whether injured, healthy, uh, trying to recover from injury, trying to improve performance in some way, um, doesn't matter. That's kind of the majority of what my business consists of. So if you're a runner that needs help in some way, feel free to reach out so we can figure out what's the best next step for you moving forward. Now, what I want you to learn today, we're going to review some of the demands of running on the kinetic chain, how it impacts the foot, core, and breathing specifically. Um, talk about specific exercises around the foot, core, and breathing, how to isolate these areas to really, uh, again, address the, the, the smaller little details, and then how to put this into bigger movement patterns, which will then better translate over to the, the sport of running. One thing I see a lot of is people isolating areas, um, which again, we need to some degree, we need to strengthen the abs. We need to uh, do calf raises to strengthen the foot and the calf. However, again, back in, I believe it was 2015, really good study out there showed that even though in a controlled setting, like a, a gym or physical therapy type setting, um, you can do all the right things to address those components, but unless you bridge the gap with specific movements that translate to actual running, and there's a very limited carryover from that, that strength conditioning physical therapy program to running. So some of the exercises I have in here today will be very specific, uh, which will really put all these pieces together for you in a nice, in a nice way. Now, when it comes to running, um, those of you who have uh, watched my webinars in the past probably have seen this slide quite a few times, but it's always good to refresh. Running is a very single leg plyometric-like activity. You are literally bounding and jumping from one leg to the next. Um, and it's also multi-joint, which is very important to understand. So going back to that whole isolation uh, component, again, we want to strengthen specific muscles, target specific muscles and joints. But in the end, because it's a multi-joint activity, we need to tie all these pieces together to teach the body how to move uh, effectively and efficiently as a whole. Okay, because there are forces up to four to six times your body weight during foot strike, being able to stabilize, absorb force and dissipate that force is super important, especially in that first half of the running cycle. Um, and this, the, the foot specifically, um, the core, 
you know, also tie in kind of how breathing impacts that entire system. All of, all of these things really matter from a stabilization and alignment standpoint, because we want to land and stabilize in the best position possible. So we then can use our strength, use our power to push off and propel the body forward. Okay. So it's important to be in the best position possible because that's what creates overall efficiency and improves running economy. Now, if we look at a couple different things, just to better understand kind of what we're going to dive into specifically here with the webinar today, um, we're not going to talk about great toe mobility specifically in this one. We're going to approach things more from a stabilization standpoint, but we need to understand that in the again, lower extremity, especially from the knee down, the big toe and the ankle are two joints that we really want to make sure we have uh, adequate range of motion. When we lose range of motion there, you typically see a lot of compensations at the foot that look like poor stabilization, could be poor balance, could be bunions, um, could be a lot of other things happening at the foot there when in reality, the limited great toe extension, limited ankle dorsiflexion actually contributed to that. So we need to make sure we're looking at the entire thing and not just specifically looking at balance stabilization as I'm gonna cover here today. Now, on this second image, looking at position of the foot and the ankle here, right? We can see this person's going into and subtalar eversion or pronation of their foot and ankle. Um, the foot is, is very important because we wanna make sure that we're, we're stabilizing as we go through that stance phase of running. This right here, again, yes, we want stabilization. This could also be caused by limited ankle mobility, could be caused by pelvic drop as you see in the third photo. So that's the reason why I really wanted to make sure we talk, we don't just talk about the foot or talk about the core, we connect these pieces together since things can more closely connected to the floor like the foot can create these issues as well as poor core stabilization, pelvic control, hip stability, those types of things as well. Um, so just because you see this ankle collapsing in right there doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Uh, this person may not be experiencing pain in any way, um, but we want to make sure we're looking at all the pieces to put them together. Now in that third image there, we're looking at pelvic control, right? We can see as she weight bears on her left side, she's in that left stance phase right there. Left pelvis is higher than right pelvis. That right pelvis is actually dropping, which means she's losing st stability throughout the, the core and hip. This is one of the most important things we want to really teach at the core is proper stabilization and control of the pelvis. Because if we're running and we're dropping every single time, that means we're losing stability. You can just see the position of the knees, right? Very narrow knee window, it's called. Knees are close together, almost knocking together. Um, tends to cause inward valgus collapse of the knees. That knee collapses in. And then this right here at that, that left ankle, you've seen the, the previous picture, something that also result from poor pelvic control. So that's something we want to really clean up at the core and the hip. Um, but not neglecting the foot in the process. Then in this last image here, um, look, just look at the overall position of this runner. This really ties into, uh, which a lot of people overlook. We think, oh, this person, we need to teach this person how to lean forward more because they're too upright. Um, when in reality, again, her, her pelvis seems to be in a pretty good position, but her upper half from that, that lumbar and thoracic spine are just overextended. So teaching proper breathing to be able to fully exhale, get the rib cage down, adopt that slight forward lean so she could be in a better position. Obviously getting, getting a, a good degree of hip extension right there and really pushing off, which we want, but reinforcing better position alignment of that upper half spine shoulder from a postural standpoint, which really goes back to breathing can be super helpful there. So we'll talk about that as well. Now at the foot, okay, there we go. So the foot, uh, role of the foot is really create this base of support that accommodates the ground, right? The ground's not going anywhere. So we need to make sure we have a foot that that's ready to accommodate the surface regardless of what it throws at us, whether we're on a trail, a sidewalk, we're stepping off a curb, we're stepping on a curb. Uh, we have, again, the, the, just the, the actual angle of the ground is kiltered one side higher than the other side. We're on a trail, there's rocks, there's trees, there's, there's sticks and, uh, and roots and what have you. So the foot needs to accommodate, accommodate this service as much, this surface as much as possible. Um, with that being said, again, we want a degree of flexibility in the foot so it can respond and really mold to that surface to create a good contact. But we also want it to be rigid to a degree, right? Because as we strike the ground, we mold to that surface. 
we start to roll into that medial arch as we absorb force. Pronation is good. It's a healthy motion there at the foot. We want that to happen. Too many people victimize pronation as, oh, I don't want, I, my foot pronates. I don't want to pronate. We want to make sure we stay out of the extreme range of overpronation or, or pronating too quickly, but we want to go in there to absorb force. And then from there, turn that foot, that ankle into more of a rigid lever that we can propel and push off. So we need a balance between flexibility and rigidity. Too much or one or the other again, is a little bit detrimental to us. We want a healthy balance of both. Um, so we can then use the foot to the greatest degree to store and release energy, right? There's a lot of little muscles in, in the foot. We have uh, muscles, we have plantar fascia, we have a spring ligament. Again, we have bigger fascial connections that connect that foot up into the calf, uh, higher up into the lower extremity. So we want to make sure we're using this series of joints, series of muscles to absorb energy, to then be able to explode and push off uh, more powerfully to propel the body forward. And then obviously the foot is, is huge from a stabilization standpoint. And that's not just, again, something that affects the ankle. Stabilization at the foot, it affects the entire lower limb, as I showed a little bit uh, on that last, slow, last slide when we look at position of the pelvis, position of the knee and hip, and what have you. Now, some of these things we really need to be mindful of. Uh, we don't just work on, we can't, when we're seeing some of these things, just work on balance and stability and assume, hey, I'm going to improve stability of the foot, ankle, hip, pelvis, core, right? We might need to clean up some of these things in the process. So I see a lot of people these days that, and whether it's through genetics, whether it's through wearing poor, poor footwear, that, that toe box is really now and really crunching those feet together, um, just lack of emphasis on training the foot to be more, to have better uh, foot dexterity, but things like bunions or halgus, hallux valgus, which is very common there. You can see in that top left photo. In that situation, we tend to see less because we're starting to see that calcification right around that first MTP joint. So we tend to see less great toe extension. Um, obviously just with the overall position of the foot, those toes coming in to be very narrow and the big toe contributing so much to stability of that foot and lower limb, uh, we're losing stability and the ability to control our position when we're on one leg. So if you're someone with a history of bunions, it's something very important to work on and address. And there's some specific exercises I'll cover here in a second. Um, like I mentioned earlier, great toe and ankle mobility. So we look at the difference between great toe extension in this top photo here, the A photo, versus the B photo. Look at the difference there, right? We need enough range of motion. We don't need to be super mobile. We don't need this toe to be, again, like a ballerina, right? Where that toe is straight up vertical 90 degrees. We don't need that much motion, but we need enough range of motion that as you go through that running cycle and you load into the big toe before you push off, we can be able to and store that elastic energy and then push off forcefully. If we're unable to load into the big toe, that's typically someone who will see a shortened stride use a lot of times a higher cadence or step rate because they're not able to actually push off and load into that great toe. So they have to turn over the legs a little bit more quickly to get through that running cycle. Okay. So this is something very important to work on addressing great toe and ankle mobility. Um, and those are actually the most important ranges of motion we need as runners is at the great toe and the ankle. Now, next up, look at the right side here. Still not sure why, when you look at this photo, the, the, the toes on the, red, the right side are, are red. You would think because that toe box was a lot wider and that foot could actually move freely, the other side would be the red toes. I still haven't figured it out yet, but it was the best, best picture I could find. Um, but looking at your footwear is really important. Uh, obviously, the, the, the running shoe industry has just grown dramatically over the years. Uh, so many different things and coming out uh, on a regular basis that work on improving running economy and, and be allowing you to be more efficient as a runner to store and release energy. We're not going to get into footwear, but I definitely recommend if you are interested in, in understanding more about running shoes, I actually did a fireside chat with a, uh, a sports chiropractor several months ago. I think she was in the fall um, and he covered running shoes specifically and what you need to think about or look at when it comes to selecting the best running shoe. But obviously you see kind of these dress shoe on the left side. We see this, this shoe on the right side with the wider toe box, understanding that these things play a big role in how the feet function. Uh, we want to make sure we're allowing that foot to spread, allowing that foot to move to the best of its facility and not just locking it in the shoe. Uh, so it's just, just going along from the ride, but not able to do its job and function at its best. And obviously all of these things together really 
contribute to poor stabilization, or you could be someone that just has poor stability and balance that you need to train that. Um, but really looking at some of these other things before you start incorporating some of these exercises we're going to show here in a few minutes, because they could be underlying issues that you need to address first or in addition to doing a lot of the stabilization, uh, foot stabilization core exercise we're going to cover. Now, if we look here, this is what's called the foot tripod. So we have three um, three points of contact here that we really want to reinforce with the foot as we're on a single leg. We have the base of that first metatarsal. We have the base of the fifth, and then we have the, the metatarsal, sorry, metatarsal heads of the first, fifth, and then right through the center of the heel. So this is what we, and I think, commonly see with a lot of people when we're losing stability. People are either going to really shift to the outside of the foot load through the lateral side or lateral longitudinal arch and lift up that medial arch, right? It's a common thing you'll see. Or other people that are going to load into that big toe, load into the medial arch where you tend to see over pronation happening, right? We wanna make sure that we have a nice wide base, nice wide foot. We're stabilizing these three points of contact at all times because this is what's gonna create the most stability at the foot uh, as possible. And then, Another reason why I wanted to connect the foot and the core is because there's, there's been some research out over the 10 years in kind of comparing the foot, a lot of these, these deeper uh, intrinsic muscles of the foot saying, okay, this is, this is more like a, a core for the foot, right? We think about the core up here. Yes, we have these bigger outer muscles, abdominals, obliques, but deeper inside we have the multifidi, transversal spinalis. We have all these other smaller little stabilizers and intrinsic muscles um, of the of the foot, which is very similar to the core. So understanding is a lot of times people think, oh, my foot, my foot hurts. I have plantar fasciitis. And look how many small intrinsic muscles we have there in the foot. There's tons of little things, little, little, little muscles, a lot of joints going on and happening here at the same time as, as you move while you run. So we need to make sure we consider things. And it's really important when it comes to strengthening that, yes, we want to do some of these bigger movements from a stability standpoint, but I'm going to show you how to isolate some of these smaller muscles in the process just to make sure you're not, not missing anything there. Now at the core, what everyone thinks about with the core here, um, more often than not, we're thinking kind of what we see here. If we're looking in the mirror, we're looking at abdominals and obliques. Yes, that's a, that's a part of the core, but the core is really every single muscle and joint that attaches to the hips, pelvis, spine, and rib cage. So that core spans a, a, a huge area, really. I mean, essentially, it could be majority of um, muscles that attach these joints throughout the body, right? It's a lot more than we, we give it credit for. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we tend to neglect this guy underneath there, guy and gal, I guess. We're looking at the diaphragm, but also the pelvic floor, right? Both of these that sit perfectly one on top of the other, um, or we want to really create that situation in that position as best as possible. Uh, this is kind of a deeper look at the core since it's so common for us to look at or think about ourselves in this way and tend to neglect that, right? So you can look at that diaphragm, right? This big dome shaped muscle that helps us get air in and out of the system. But like I mentioned a second ago, every muscle joint that connects to the rib cage, the spine, and then we think of pelvic floor down here on the pelvis, right? A lot of these muscles are, are connected to all of those same areas that we're talking about with the core. So we need to make sure we don't neglect breathing in the process, which, which typically happens, right? We're trying to strengthen a lot of these muscles when learning proper stabilization, learning proper breathing will go a whole lot longer than just having strong abs. Now, from a breathing standpoint, when we have impaired breathing, some of the things we'll see, if we just look at this is kind of picture in the center, this person here, obviously there's the showing in the green proper breathing, which is showing good position of what's called the canister. The canister is the position of the rib cage, spine and pelvis as they sit one on top of the other. So if we think of almost this right here, right? This is our canister. This is what we want to create. A lot of times with poor breathing, uh, we either kind of default to what you see on the left side, in increase in lumbar lordosis, more of a rounded belly position. And you can just see the alignment of those purple dots, right? Obviously we're losing alignment of the, of the skeleton. And then on the right side here, more of a hollowed position, right? As we get into more of a flat lumbar spine, more curved through that thoracic, but look at the, the angle 
in the alignment of those purple dots there, right? So we want to make sure we're really creating this canister as much as possible. I tend to see more people in this left side here who are in a state of inhalation and their chest is a little bit more pumped out, their back is more arched, their rib cage is flared, and we're trying to get that rib cage to come down to be in a better position. Uh, we'll talk about that more here in a second because that's really going to relate on how we want to set up when it comes to breathing, core stabilization, and tying all these pieces together. Now, the core serves multiple purposes. First and foremost, respiration, which we can't neglect. Uh, we're always more often than not focusing on creating movement, preventing movement, right? With that core strengthening, core stabilization. Uh, respiration is just that, that, that deeper intrinsic function of the core, protecting a lot of those vital organs. We have those muscles surrounding there to protect those organs, but also using the diaphragm to create some pressure gradient to get air in and out of the lungs, right? Because we need to, to fuel the body with oxygen and energy to the best of its ability. And then obviously storage and release of energy. This is really important. Um, we think of running here, and we look at this guy here in the center. Um, you can see as he's on his left leg, right arm is forward. So we have this reciprocal relationship or opposite relationship, opposite arm and opposite leg. So the core in the middle helps us really tie together that lower body and upper body. Uh, Oftentimes we think of running in solely as a lower body sport, but the upper body does contribute to some degree if we think about the core, the spine, the rib cage, and the shoulder, right? Just to create efficient movement, efficient locomotion, we need that opposite arm, opposite leg action, which we're trans, really transmitting energy from the lower body, the upper body, and vice versa. Now, You've heard me say a couple times now, uh, stabilization, right? Kind of one of the big things we're going to talk about here today is stabilization as opposed to strength, right? We're not just going to talk about strengthening specific muscles, but how to stabilize the entire system. So stabilization helps to optimize the position of the foot, lower limb, and trunk, right? We want to op we want to create a nice aligned environment where foot is stable, leg is aligned, not collapsing inward there at the knee or the foot. Pelvis is nice and level, again, it's going to drop to some degree, about five degrees per side is healthy, but make sure we're not dropping too much like we saw on the woman in the beginning. Um, and then obviously good vertical position of the spine with some degree of rotation. So we want alignment, we want proper positioning of the body as we bound and literally have to absorb two to six times our body weight, right? Because we want to absorb and dissipate force. There's a lot of force coming down on that leg. So we want to be in the best, best position possible to dissipate that force. So we're not landing too abruptly, too hard to create issues like overuse tendon issues, bone stress injuries, but also be in a good position as we go through mid stance that we can forcefully push off and, and propel the body forward. Like I mentioned a second ago, transfer of energy, and then also all of these things tied together from a, a movement efficiency standpoint. So we just look at, uh, sorry, something's blocking me here. Let me move this one second. There we go. Something on my end blocking the... There we go. So if we just look at uh, what happens here, we're not really worrying about running form here, just a video just to show running. But if we look at how she comes in here to strike the ground on her left foot, right, landing in that supinated position, striking on that lateral heel, which is uh, typical and common, rolling more into a neutral position, foot then tends to collapse and conservatively into the arch. We wanna make sure we're not going too far into pronation. Um, and then from there, that foot is going to re-supinate as we start to shift weight because that's how we create a rigid lever at the foot and the ankle to be able to push off forcefully. Now, all of those things are important because if we're either landing too hard here, we're pronating too far and that knee collapses in, that pelvis is dropping, that's going to create a cascade of events up the connect chain, which leads to more efficient running form and possibly injury doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be injured when you see over pronation or valgus collapse the knee or pelvic drop, um, but it's, uh, it, they are risk factors for injury. But if we look at the core, what happens here at the core? All we're trying to do really is to centrate the rib cage on top of the pelvis, right? To be in a good position, rib cage over pelvis. Like we talked about creating that canister earlier for proper breathing, because that's when those muscles function at their best to stabilize the spine and pelvis. Um, using those muscles around the core to stabilize the hip and the pelvis so we're not getting into that, that opposite side pelvic drop. And then obviously tying into the hip as well, because if we're not strong, stable, uh, holding the pelvis and the hip in position, that's when we see less efficient 
movement as, uh, overall as we run. So just some basic things we look at with running um, and, and what we wanna really reinforce here as we implement some of these exercises. So now one of my favorite quotes, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. Um, it's very easy to strengthen muscles, but if you don't have that underlying, that intrinsic stability to stabilize your joints, uh, to stabilize the foot, the knee, the hip, the spine, right? We're getting stronger in areas, but we're usually not able to express it as much because we're losing stability, we're unstable. So if we think of this, something I've shared a bit in the past, right? You, you can't fire, how far is that cannonball gonna go, right? We're aiming for this long, this straight line for that trajectory right there, but that, that canoe is not stable, right? It's just floating out there in the ocean. So as soon as you fire that cannon, right? That cannon could be the strongest, most powerful cannon you have. But if that cannon is in a canoe and it's just floating out in the middle of the ocean, it's, it's pretty ineffective. So obviously you can see that cannonball just kind of coming off kerplunk right in the water. It's not going anywhere. So what we need to do and make sure of here is we're not just strengthening, creating a stronger cannon. We are working on stabilizing the boat in the canoe. Let's get that canoe. Let's get some anchors. Let's tie it down, right? Let's secure it to the ocean floor. Let's put it on a dock. Let's, let's, let's pull it on shore temporarily, right? Let's stabilize the canoe. So as we fire that cannon, it has a strong base or strong, a strong foundation in which to kind of function and, and do its job to the best of its ability. So this is really important. We think about stabilization. Stabilization provides that foundation and that base. So yes, strengthen muscles, continue to strengthen specific muscles to get stronger and more powerful. But at the same point, you need to understand how you're going to create a, a, a more stable and reliable base. And that comes from the stabilization. Now, what I want to do here is introduce a, the first little poll of the night. All right, so I'm gonna launch a quick poll here. Hopefully you guys can all see it, depending on how you are accessing the webinar today. Couple simple questions to see how well you're paying attention or how long of a day it's been for you. Um, if you're watching this or listening in on this on your phone, you may not see the questions being asked. Just sit tight for a second here. So question number one, running is a single leg plyometric like in multi-joint activity. Is that true or false? Question two, the foot needs to possess which of the following for optimal running, flexibility, rigidity, stabilization. Is that which one of those or is it all of the above? Three, the diaphragm is one of the most important core muscles as it helps a gas exchange, creates a canister formation at the ribcage, spine, and pelvis, and promotes stability at the trunk and lower limb. Take a minute here. Let's try to get about 80, 90% of you to complete this. just for a little break in the action here. We wanna cover some exercises next, isolation exercises for the foot and core, and then how to connect those pieces together. Oh wait, let's get a couple more people. One or two more, 70, 80% have completed it. I'm gonna give two seconds. All right, let's wrap up here. All right, so let's just review Really quickly, running is a single leg plyometric like activity. Yes, that's true. The foot needs to possess which of the following? All of the above, right? We want it to be flexible to mold and, and, and really encounter, encounter the surface as best as possible. We want it to be rigid to function as a lever to push off and propel the body, but we also want stabilization. And then three, the diaphragm is one of the most important muscles as it's, it's all of the above, does all of those things. Sorry, I got a cat here running in front of me. All right, guys, let's move on. Now, looking at the foot specifically, there was actually quite a few people there were again, coming off of some kind of foot injury uh, and wanted specific exercises, wanted to make sure we looked at isolated uh, foot exercises. And some of you that were in my private Facebook group might have seen some of these I've shared recently, um, looking at how to improve again bunions or the hallux valgus uh, position at the great toe. So. When it comes to the foot, we want the foot to be strong and stable, right? We looked before and saw a lot of these uh, intrinsic muscles there. We usually do a good job strengthening these extrinsic muscles with calf raises, uh, do heel walks, we do toe walks, we do those kinds of things. Um, but we don't really do as well as good of a job strengthening these smaller intrinsic muscles. So depending on if you come from a 
a history of foot injuries, lower extremity injuries, uh, poor stability and balance. These are some specific foot and, and toe exercises that might be helpful to you. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, exercises. These are just a handful that I find are the most impactful as it relates to stabilizing the foot, building that dexterity. So we're not can either collapsing into that medial arch or losing balance and stability overall. So first one here, if we look at passive great toe abduction. So what that means is we're just trying to restore the position between that big toe and metatarsal. Metatarsal is that longer bone that aligns with this, the first metatarsal that aligns with the big toe that's through the bulk of the foot. A lot of times, just over time, we have that big toe that's going to tends to come over from, from wearing tight fitting foot, footwear like we talked about, or it could be genetics or other factors. But this first drill is just teaching you how to find that aligned position of the big toe, how to work on mobilizing to some degree, getting that big toe aligned, because we want that nice wide base of the foot. The nice wide base allows us to really have a good contact with the floor so we can maintain and promote stability as much as possible. So that's just a, almost like a, a starter exercise. If you're someone that in alignment of the foot, everything is in perfect alignment. We have good space between the toes. We're not in more of that collapsed position of that big toe coming in. This is something you can skip over. Now, next up, isometric great toe flexion, right? One of the most important roles of the toes in the foot with running is propulsion. We want these toes to be nice and strong, right? So we want a good position of the big toe, but we want to also be able to create force in the ground as we push off, right? That, that helps us create that rigid lever to then propel the body forward. So this one right here is specifically looking at strengthening, isometrically strengthening the big toe. So we want to find that aligned position first, actively push that big toe down into the floor, but you can see there that toe, we want to keep that toe long, right? Tendency for a lot of people, over time is to claw the toes, right? This is just usually shows an imbalance between some of the uh, extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the foot. So being able to lay your toes long, firmly pushing that big toe down, that's what we wanna create here. So aligning the toe, actively pushing down into the ground and working on creating strength throughout that, that first great toe there. Now this one's a bit tricky. Um, looking at great toe abduction, because we're in the tendency to be in this, these shoes that are more narrow, uh, we lose the ability to use this great toe to get automatically on our own, pull it out in more of that abducted position and splay the toes. So this exercise helps us strengthen that, what's called the, uh, the abductor halysis, which is a muscle in the arch of the toe. And you can see, I point to it here at some point right there, right through that inside arch of the toe. So I'm trying to actively push that toe in as I'm using that abductor halysis muscle to push the toe out, right? So just learning how to improve dexterity of the foot, control some of these muscles, because we're gonna put this into play in a second. And then lastly, all these pieces together, teaching proper dexterity, how to get into that lift spread reach. This is almost a, a first step before you get into toe yoga. I know a lot of people uh, are familiar with toe yoga that have gone through uh, physical therapy for again, plantar fasciitis or Achilles, post tib tendinopathy, those types of things. Um, toe yoga is pretty common. This is one we're just teaching us how to extend, how to abduct and splay, and then how to lay those toes firmly down on the ground. Because if we can use this position, to set up for a lot of our single leg stabilization exercises, we can create this wider base to then stabilize with the floor. Okay. Let me see here. I got a one question. So are you lifting the toe or lifting and spreading? Which one, Carol? Let me know which exercise you're talking about there. All right. So now when it comes to the first one, we're simply spreading the toe. So if you think of the toes being close together like this, we're just pushing that big toe over and trying to find proper alignment of that toe with its own metatarsal bone right there. Okay. So when it comes to breathing and a few people here interested in breathing, we're not going to talk about breathing with running. We're going to talk about breathing in its most and fundamental form here, very simple way. A lot of times we, we try to do things the hardest way possible, which is how do I breathe while I run? 
Well, if we don't practice breathing in a controlled environment, it's very unlikely that we're going to do it well while running. So let's learn how to do it well in a controlled way first, and then be able to implement that with running. Biggest thing with breathing is it, it's, we're not just talking about the lungs, the diaphragm, we're talking about how it really connects with the rib cage, the spine in the pelvis. Because most people, like I mentioned earlier, are in this inflated position. Again, chest, rib cage open here, lower back arch. So when we get it to do some of our core stability exercises, we're already at a disadvantage because we have an increase in lordosis or arch at that lumbar spine. So rather than always thinking about pelvic tilt, which I think people think about too much, using breathing as a setup tool to get in the right position, to find that neutral spine, to get the rib cage down, find neutral at the spine, find neutral at the pelvis. This is something that almost does the trick for you rather than always thinking about the pelvic tilt because the pelvic tilt is going to neglect the rib cage, which then keeps us at a disadvantage when it comes to breathing. Okay. So just going to run you through the sequence here. So with this first thing we're trying to do, you can see me laying in the position, my hands are on my rib cage. So ribs are naturally kind of in an open position. As I inhale, we tend to see that the opening up of the rib cage of the chest to get more air into the system. So ribs tend to flare. And as we exhale, you'll see the rib cage coming down, right? Look at that rib cage come down. What this does, that creates that canister formation I talked about. So rib cage on top of pelvis. This first position here of inhaling, exhaling is working on getting more mobility from your rib cage, teaching that rib cage how to come down into a better position. So we're not always open in a flared position. So if you take, if you're just sitting there and you take a nice deep breath in, and you feel how the rib cage becomes more prominent, the exhale is going to do the opposite of that. It's going to get us out of that position as the rib cage comes down to better centrate and create this canister. So just to show a couple of breaths, so you can see me almost assisting with my hands a little bit. I have a lot of people that are immobile in their rib cage, actually use their hands to push on the ribs to find a better position since so it's hard to do. And now actually creating that canister. So we want to get in this position, full exhale, rib cage down. You can see right here, I'm going to lightly engage the abdominals and that anterior abdominal wall. What that does is helps, it helps shorten the space between the rib cage and the pelvis. So as I take my next inhale, I'm not just automatically opening back up into that rib flare position. My anterior abdominal wall here, abdominals, obliques that tie in there connecting the rib cage with the pelvis to a better degree and I'm preventing myself from opening up so I can expand outward and we'll kind of put more on top of that here in a second so you can see there not expanding up in my chest as much rib cage is down abdominals are lightly engaged and I'm expanding or starting to expand around the core again you can put your hands in various positions just to test say, okay am I breathing too much in my chest where is it coming from um, with that being said with that being said, we're not super concerned about belly breathing, right? So as we look at in this next one, and you can see my hands in that position right there, I don't want to solely breathe into the belly. We want to start to breathe 360 degrees around that abdominal wall, around that rib cage. And this is what this next part of this drill will do. So exhale, rib cage down, engaging that anterior abdominal wall to hold that rib cage down in position as I start to inflate around the core. So I'm gonna put my fingertips, if you feel right in the front side of your hips and your, your pelvis there, you have that bony prominence there, that anter anterior, an anterior superior iliac spine, find that spot just in front, see if you can inflate into that area. And then you can see I switched my hands to the lateral side. Now I wanna see, can I breathe out and expand around? I wanna breathe in all directions around that core and not just solely into the belly right? That's 360 degree breathing. Now, once I get that down, I'm going to tie together breathing with stabilization. This is where most people go wrong. We focus on breathing in some way, a lot of times meditation um, for some people, and then we do core exercises, but we never marry these two things together, right? We talked about the diaphragm being this deep intrinsic uh, core muscle. It needs to breathe, right? Breathing is going to be its prime function. So if you think if we don't teach breathing with stabilization together, you get out there and run, what's going to happen? You're going to breathe. Uh, you're not going to stabilize without breathing. So you need to make sure you're teaching yourself how to do both of these properly to really use that diaphragm to the best of its ability. 
All I'm doing here is that same setup. Exhale, rib cage down, engage that interior abdominal wall. Legs are up in the air. I'm monitoring my position or where I'm breathing into, that anterior aspect of the core, the lateral aspect of the core to expand 360 degrees. And then obviously with the legs up in the air right there, I have to stabilize the spine and the pelvis. If I am not breathing properly, I'm not set up properly and the legs are lifted in the air, that's when I'm gonna to start to go into more of an arch position. And then this is the foundation for a lot of core stability exercises right here. This is what I would put dead bugs on top of. This is what I would put, a lot of my clients know, bent legs lowering, straight legs lowering. Um, somewhat similar but different setup, hip bridging, single leg hip bridging, hip bridge with marching. I would keep the feet on the ground. I would set up the same exact way, get the rib cage down, get yourself breathing properly first and then get up into the hips. Because this, what happens as well when you do hip bridging exercises like that is if you are not in a centrated or canister position throughout the core, back is a little more arched, ribs are more flared. We can't get fully up into the hips to access that hip extension. So this is the setup position that we want to get into for any type of hip bridging or core stability. And then also some of these bigger exercises, which I'll show here in a second. So that's just a four step series. You might decide that you have difficulty getting the rib cage down. You stop at step one, right? You, there's no need to put stabilize, uh, stability and challenge that more if you can't get into the right position. Um, if you're not breathing properly, you're not engaging that interior abdominal wall properly, there's no need to step forward. So take your time on this, practice it every single day, get the rib cage down, get all of the air out of the lungs. It's a long exhale, probably over 10, 12 seconds. Don't short that. Rib cage down, anterior abdominal wall engaged, breathing 360 degrees, monitor those two spots in the front and the side, even put your hands under your lower back and see if you feel pressure as you inhale without at all times rib cage opening up and then add that stability component. Again, this is core stability and it's in its simulated, most isolated form here. Now, when we connect things together, uh, we need to understand how are we going to use the foot? How are we going to use the core and breathing together as a unit, right? We're talking about multi-joint movements when it comes to running. So we can't just stop at that, right? We isolated different things. Let's put them together and marry them together. So we really help improve running performance to the best of our ability. Sorry, this cat's driving me crazy right now. He's just sleeping all day and he's up now kind of messing with me. All right. So connecting the dots, um, these chop and lift variations are, are some of my favorites when it comes to learning proper stabilization of the lower extremity, getting in a good position at the core while breathing. So if we look at the video here on the left side, half kneeling chop and lift, I'm going to keep my back knee on the floor. I'm going to try to set up with a good aligned position of the legs, foot nice and stable with the ground. Uh, because I know I'm going to get yelled at from a few people for wearing shoes right here, take off your shoes. Anytime you're doing any kind of stabilization exercise for the lower extremity, um, do them barefoot, do them with socks on, allow your foot to move and splay and see what happens there rather than wearing shoes, especially running shoes. Um, let's see here. All right, so as we play this video, what I would do first, right? I'm setting up, I'm setting up in an aligned position. I'm going to probably take a nice deep exhale. <sighs> Rib cage down, anterior abdominal wall engage, abs engage, breathing and engaging 360 degrees around the core, right? And making sure I'm maintaining proper stabilization of that foot, good contact with that foot tripod into the ground, alignment of the knee. I'm not losing that stability as I go through this nice and slow rotational motion. Only reason I chose this was because it's, it's somewhat similar to running, right? We're in this lunge position, which we can lunge position is very similar, half kneeling position to running one foot forward, one foot back, I have to stabilize some, in, to some degree like that. Um, I can breathe, I can exhale, I can get the rib cage down, I can stabilize the foot, I can continue to breathe as I move through just a slight rotational motion at the spine, because that's what's happening while you run, right? We're rotating to a small degree side by side. So we're teaching that lower half, the foot, the knee, the hip, the pelvis, the spine, and breathing, how to stabilize as we use that upper half thoracic spine shoulders to go through a rotational pattern. So this is a very just simple, but challenge, so just deceivingly challenge, challenging uh, core stability exercise. Then what we would do from there is we would elevate the back knee. So I want you to watch what happens here to me. 
good example of where stability goes wrong, right? I want to do the same exact thing. I'm going to lift that back knee off the ground this time um, to make it harder to stabilize, to sink more weight into the lower body. So I need to align, really stabilize the foot into the ground, nice wide foot, base of the big toe pushing down, stable arch, alignment of the knee and the hip with that ankle. Exhale, rib cage down. And then I'm going to go through that rotational motion with the back knee elevated. So you can see here, I'm going to lift up slightly. I want to get all that, those set up things first, which I don't do for the video. I usually describe to people more if I'm writing their program, but you can see just that instability. Again, something that happens a lot of times on the first rep is you're getting used to the position. Well, this is what typically happens for most people, right? We start shifting that weight. We're losing stability. Knees start to move around. We start to lose our stability and our overall alignment. So we need to make sure like right there, we're really controlling that foot and really sticking it into the ground. Nice wide foot base using that tripod, those three connections, placing that big toe firmly into the ground. This is where doing some of those isolated foot exercises really helps translate to bigger overall stability movements. All right, so those are the chop and lifts. Now, these ones right here, you might be looking at like, wow, core training, is that really core training? This is where we're connecting those pieces together, right? We're, we're teaching the foot, we're teaching the, the ankle, the hip, uh, the pelvis, the core, how to control our overall position that's more specific to running. There are no planks in here. I still, obviously, my people do that, right? We do front planks, we do side planks, we do dead bugs and hip ridges. Those are more isolated, in my opinion, to the core. Um, these are how we put everything together in bigger functional movement patterns that will then translate specifically to the sport. So standing hip abduction, those of you in the private Facebook group, you probably saw this on Monday. I, I posted and highlighted this one in the new exercise of the week series. Um, with this, what we wanna do here is we get set up we can see I'm standing on a plate. So as I lift up, pelvis is level, if not higher. I don't want to go into a drop position like you saw earlier in the webinar. Exhale, rib cage down, engage the abs, anterior abdominal wall, continue to breathe and expand around the core, and then connect that foot with the platform, with the weight, with the stair, whatever you're standing on. So this is putting together all of those components in a very simple yet challenging drill. You'll see if we're unstable here, you'll see that foot moving around. You'll see that lack of stability in the knee. The pelvis could be dropping, body could be really tilting to one side. Um, it's a really simple looking full body exercise that connects everything together. Now, next one, and it was kind of, I wanna make sure you see that here. So we're gonna do an overhead step up next. As we raise the arms overhead, the tendency is for the back to arch and the rib cage to open. So what that requires is for us to take a nice deep exhale, rib cage down, find that canister position. We don't want that canister to be open as we're up and arched in the back and ribs open. We wanna find that proper position so we can stabilize the pelvis, stabilize the hip, and then really place that foot nice and firmly into the, the step. Now watch what I do here as I raise the arms overhead. It's quick, but exhale, rib cage down, engage, continue to breathe. And then work on stabilizing everything in the process. Foot, arch, big toe pushing down, rib cage down, alignment of the leg. A lot of people, again, are, are only focusing on let's just step up on something rather than let's put these pieces together in a way that's going to create good alignment and position of the entire system of the canister, which is that rib cage, spine, and pelvis, of the pelvis itself being level across, and then good alignment of the leg with control from the foot. All of that stuff has to work together to stabilize you, right? That's a good motion overall. Standing airplane can be a bit tricky. Um, in this one here, what we're going to do is it's, get into more of a hip hinge position. So rotating around the hip joint, but it's a very challenging exercise to keep the core engaged, continue to breathe the rib cage down, stabilize the foot into the ground, because now we're moving into that rotational pattern. So it's very easy for that foot to really rock and roll in either direction. And we have to stabilize the big toe into the ground, stabilize the arch in the foot, not to lose stability, and then rotate throughout that hip joint. A lot of people are familiar with single leg deadlifts. This is a, a progression of that, that works on more foot control stabilization, but getting that core in a position where we're moving that spine and pelvis as a unit, we're connecting things together. Then lastly, if you know 
work with me. We do tons of marching, slow motion marching, dumbbell marching, one dumbbell, two dumbbell. Um, in this position here, very, very specific to running. Uh, really works on stabilizing the foot, aligning the leg, controlling the pelvis, setting up with your breathing, rib cage down, creating your canister, and then just keeping your body in a nice vertical controlled position at all times. So as I step down, making sure the dumbbells are not pulling me or swinging me side to side, I'm tall, I'm aligned, I'm stabilizing the entire system. This is how you really get all of these exercises together. The foot, the hip, the pelvis, the core, breathing. You continue to breathe throughout every single one. You should be able to breathe, stabilize, balance all at the same time. If you notice you get to a point where you hold your breath, you probably have taken a step too far. Now you're, you're again, you're, you're, set, you're compromising breathing for a harder exercise that's more challenging, probably too challenging for where you need to be. So take a step back, get the breathing, get the stabilization to happen at the same time. And that's when good things will happen. So now as we start to wrap up here, what I want to do is throw up one last poll and we'll, we'll wrap up. So question one, foot dexterity is a term that refers to the ability to control the foot and toes in an efficient manner. Is that true or false or none of the above? Um, during core stabilization and other movements, we must train the diaphragm to do what simultaneously? Is it breathe, stabilize, hiccup, or none of the above? In order for the, your strength and movement training to carry over to running, you must incorporate relevant functional movement patterns that translate to your end goal right behind you. Is that true or false? I'm going to give you guys 20 seconds to complete this so we can wrap up. Oh, yeah, on number two, that's multiple choice. So make sure you're picking multiple answers. It's, it's two answers to give you a hint. All right, gonna go five seconds. 64%, 67% completed. I'm gonna cut you guys off, put something in there. And that's it. All right, so quickly going through the results, foot dexterity, ability to control the foot and toes in an efficient manner, true. During core stabilization, other movements, we must train the diaphragm to do what simultaneously? Breathe and stabilize. Um, in order for your strength and movement training to carry over, functional patterns that translate to your end goal, that is true. All right, guys, so let's start to wrap up. So final thoughts here. Um, you need to understand the role of stabilization, how the body is connected. Those of you know, I have spoken a lot about core stability in the past. Uh, again, you can't stabilize the core without also stabilizing the limb with running. You're, you're, you're landing with so much force on that leg. Core stability matters, but we need to connect it throughout the entire system. The whole body is interconnected. Um, look beyond traditional core training. So like today, we didn't really show you specific core exercises. Uh, but showed you how breathing and the core needs to be set up and then performed in those other movements. How to breathe, get the rib cage down, engage the core, breathe around, stabilize the spine, and then how to put that into play with your step up, with your standing hip abduction, with your marching. Um, that should connect the dots a lot better since, again, we're not flexing, extending, we're not going through all this motion. Yes, it's okay to, st to strengthen those muscles, but teach yourself how to stabilize the core, how to breathe properly as you perform lower body movements. As always, general strategies will get general results. I recommend everyone get an evaluation. Uh, why waste your time, in my opinion? Understand what you need specifically, what are your weak links, address those, um, rather than spending time doing things just to do things. And then as always, take your shoes off and breathe, right? We need to do these things more often. Um, take your shoes off for these core stability movements, take them off especially uh, after running, right? Get out of those running shoes. Don't strength training in those running shoes, especially with the, uh, again, high stack heights in, in differential. We want to get out of those shoes as much as possible and then continue to work on your breathing while doing movements and also throughout your daily routine. So entering the raffles right now, hopefully I, I gave you a good idea on how you, were go how you can improve core training, foot, hip, pelvis, core, uh, in a good way that will impact your running. If you're interested in entering the raffle, uh, we'll be raffling off one free month in the healthy running program. Uh, this will provide in one whole month of us working together, running analysis, injury risk assessment, 
running, retraining, strength training, injury reduction pro program, and then how we're going to adjust, really progress and change that program over a period of time to fit your needs. One month is touching your, uh, your toe in the water there, right? It's, it's the bare minimum, but at least allows you to uh, us to figure out a way, how are we going to put you in the best position? How are we going to find that target? What are your needs and put you in that direction? A lot of people are, are aiming over here with their strength training program when they want to be going this direction. So best align you um, to, to see good results with your running. All right. Now, if you do not win the raffle, happy to help you in any way possible, whether that's just to provide you some advice, you have specific questions about what we covered today, you want to talk about that, you might be interested in a program or just based on what you need, I might tell you, you need to be evaluated. We need to complete a running analysis. My intention going into the uh, these customization calls is not to sell you in any way. Uh, I hope I can just guide you with some simple solutions and you can go and execute that. So it's not a sales call. Just know that in advance, it's my way to help you. Um, just remember, nothing changes. Nothing changes, right? Pooh Bear, uh, man of wisdom here. So make sure you're understanding what you need to change based on this. And if you don't know what needs to change, you're reaching out directly. I texted you a couple minutes ago. There's also a link. Schedule that customization call. Let's figure out specifically what you need to do moving forward uh, rather than just doing things to do things. Let's try to get a little bit more specific. So I just want to say thank you guys. I appreciate you hanging out with me on this Thursday evening, um, a little bit later than usual for the webinars, but seem to get a good crowd at that seven o'clock hour. Tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time, I will be sending the webinar replay. I will be taking the names, everyone that entered their name into the raffle. I will be, again, selecting one lucky person, um, picking who is that winner, and then I'll be entering that name as well. Make sure you check that email just so you don't miss that. Uh, I'll give you a, a 24 hours or so to get back to me. If you don't get back to me, I'll move on to the next person. Uh, schedule that customization call. Understand how, if you have a history of plantar fasciitis, Achilles, tendinopathy, calf strains, an IT band syndrome. I mean, any, all this stuff is so relevant to that controlling the pelvis, stabilizing the foot. Let's figure out which exercises in here are the most valuable for you. Uh, make sure you look in your spam folder. If you don't receive that email from me tomorrow at 11 a.m., 11.05, 11.10, check your spam folder. It should be in there. If not, reach out directly and I will make sure you get the information. So if you have questions, ask them right now. Thanks, Carol. It says <laughs> anonymous attendee, shoes off and outside. I, I can imagine who that is, Jessica. I should have done all these videos outdoors in the, in the remaining snow just for you. But yeah, guys, make sure you're getting your shoes off as much as possible. Terry, I will 100% enter you in the raffle. I also would love for you to win. Um, as we get a couple questions in here, I just want to run off, run, run through a few things that people asked in the registration. Jen, the cat was cracking. Yeah, the, the cat's driving me crazy. He's still sitting right up here. He was sleeping all day long and now he wants to come out. So I need to wear him out before I go to sleep because he'll, he'll start sprinting over me at night. Um, so Sue asks, how to strengthen my core hamstrings and glutes so I don't continue to injure my hamstrings. So when you're looking at the hamstrings specifically, um, we need to understand that it could be caused by different things. Limited gray toe extension, limited ankle mobility. Uh, again, hip flexor tightness, poor hip extension weakness of the hamstrings and also again some type of lack of strength lack of uh, poor firing connectivity at the glutes a lot of times we look at the hamstring as a hamstring issue um i was working with someone the other day just just chronic hamstring issues you can as we test her in different single leg positions i could really just is just push her out of hip extension, meaning that glute on that side was weaker. So you really need to investigate to see what's going on specifically. Uh, but I always recommend your bridging variations, focusing on breathing first, getting that centration of the canister. Because if we're not getting the rib cage, the spine and the pelvis in position first, and we're getting up to a hip bridge, we're usually not at the top of that hip bridge. We're usually not into full hip extension. We usually drop slightly. So then we're actually using the hamstrings more. We should be strengthening the glutes. And then isolating the, the hamstrings with unspecific exercises, whether it's a whether it's a ball curl, could be a Romanian deadlift exercise, uh, those types of things. Vicky, 100% need new shoes to do strength training, or just take those shoes off. I know you're probably going from the from the beaches down there in, in Florida right into the gym. So you can just go have your sandals on and, and, and kick those off. Julie, any suggestions for continuous calf strain? Yes, look at the foot. 
Um, good chance, depending on your running, I would definitely, depending on where the calf strain is, if, if it's medial or lateral, um, good chance of some type of foot instability issue going on there. You could be over pronating as you get into the early stance phase of running, which really loads up that medial calf. Um, limited ankle range of motion, limited great toe range of motion. There's so many little things to look at with that calf strength and endurance. So I would probably do a single leg calf raise. You want to do about 20 to 25 repetitions per side. And I would see, are you weaker uh, or do you fatigue quicker? Do you cramp on one side versus the other side? Also with the calf, another thing you want to consider, because that's kind of our, our push off mechanism. You want to look at the hip as well. You want to see Am I actually extending throughout through the glute, extending throughout the hip to push off? Am I strong in that posterior chain? If you're not, you could be compensating by overloading that calf to propel the body forward. So one of those uh, six things are definitely important to consider, uh, but feel free to schedule that call. We can look at all those things pretty easily if you want to test those to see what's, what's going on there. Okay, so... Nicolette said, I'm having pain when I take off to run in my left side sit bone area, super deep. Do you have any suggestions, stretch, strength, back off running? Um, hard to say without looking at that. Um, so if it's on the sit bone, again, I would definitely consider, is this some type of, is it constant with the running or is it only as you push off and then it goes away as you get into your run? I would definitely consider is a high hamstring tendinopathy or ischial bursitis or something like that. Um, typically pain in the left side sit bone area, you want to stay away from stretching a lot of times. You want to stay out of those hamstring stretch positions just because due to our anatomy and that ischial tuberosity is more like a bony prominence coming up that sit bone. As you stretch, you compress that hamstring as it turns into what's called the sacrotuberous ligament that goes up to the pelvis. You compress that directly into the sit bone. So a lot of times too much stretching of that area leaves it irritated and inflamed. So you probably want to focus on your strength exercises, your hip bridge variation, getting the hip into extension to not compress that, maybe long lever bridges, letting the legs do a hip bridge, let the legs extend out a little bit more away from the body. Those are probably better solutions for you. Um, yeah, so it sounds like you probably have some kind of tendinopathy. If it's sit bone, take off, take off mainly, it hurts more when you're done. Um, I probably would say it's probably some kind of type of hamstring tendinopathy limit your, your hill running as much as possible, your, your incline, incline, decline, uh, or also looking at, are you over striding as that foot lands too far in front of the body? It's going to create a little more stress throughout that hamstring, which attaches up in there. So it, there's a few things, but feel free to reach out. Uh, if we can talk about that, uh, any suggestions for shin splints, all of the foot stuff we covered today, understanding foot stability, um, depending on where that shin splint is, that's kind of like a catch all term for shin pain. So is it, is it the post tib? Is it the anterior tibialis? Is it actually the shin making sure we're not getting into some kind of bone stress injury? If it's on the bone itself, hopefully it's around the bone and some of the soft tissue. Uh, but a lot of your calf raise variations, your soleus, again, soleus strengthening exercises, uh, making sure you're not over striding as you run. If it's, is the tibia and it's more of a bone thing. Um, there's a few different things. Oh, Beth. All right, Beth. So I, I looked into this. I looked into this. All right. So stitch in your side. And I actually looked through the research. The research is so bad on talking about like that cramping, that abdom that, that lateral side abdominal cramp or stitch people call it. So I actually wrote this down because I was looking into this like crazy because it's, it's, it's something obviously I have experienced. Everyone has experienced. I say majority of runners experience that every single year. So I was like, okay, let's see if there's any research on that. So they turned, they called it exercise related transient abdominal pain, right? This long name for the stitch. Um, what they have found is they don't know. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're leading towards, we have this inner lining inside that almost uh, encircles our abdominal cavity. It's called the parietal peritoneum that for some reason, there's some irritation of that peritoneum, which causes that pain on the lateral side. They have showed that it's possible that drinking too, drinking too much before eating too eating too soon in relation to your run, um, poor breathing. They said poor posture, uh, poor core stability, core strength can contribute to it. But those are all assumptions at this point. There's really nothing that they know uh, conclusive in that area. 
besides it's probably, it's possibly a breathing issue, but they're thinking it's actually not a breathing issue after all. It's something having to do with that inner lining of the cavity. Um, so I will definitely look into that a little bit more. I have a research article that I have saved that I'm gonna dig into. So we'll definitely, we can talk about that more. Awesome, Richard, sit bone pain, SI joint. Yeah, that's one of the catch-all uh, diagnoses as well. SI joint dysfunction means means something, means nothing at the same time. Uh, bridges, hip flexor stretches, other things. That's awesome. Uh, yep, could be breathing, possible. A lot of the research says it, it most likely isn't breathing. There were other factors that they said it were much more likely than breathing, but breathing was was pretty low on that risk. So that's definitely a possibility. All right, guys, so let's let's start to wrap up here. For those of you that are still hanging out, um, I hope you guys have a great night. Thank you for joining me on the webinar this evening. Schedule that call. Let's find a time to chat, especially if you have specific questions, injuries, how to customize this to, uh, into a strength training program to see better results moving forward. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Have a good Thursday night and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks again.